awesome. Yeah. Why? I don't even. What's your last name? Merriweather. Merriweather. Yeah. Like I said, Merriweather Lewis. Okay. Yeah. Lewis and Clark. Yeah. 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 Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. You have one of the most fun shirts that's ever been on the show. Okay. And, and potentially two. What? So the other one. Is bad, oh, bad art. Yeah. Bad art. Yeah. Because it's part of the process. So. You think bad art? You think good art? Yeah. Yeah. Who? Who was it? There's somebody. There's somebody out there that's with a clip that's going around social media. It's made the rounds a few times, mm -hmm. and it's basically saying. When you start doing something, you're gonna you're gonna suck at it, and you keep doing it, and eventually, you you don't suck a lot. Like you suck so little that you're kind of good, right? And that's the way that, that he phrases it, and I really like that because I think that that so perfectly illustrates you know, martial arts, strongman, and so many of these other things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of consistency. Yeah, that's that's something that I heard. Quite a bit like when I'm for myself, for you know, I'm also a personal trainer, so when I'm um, training or coaching, or whatever you want to call it, um, yeah, I, I, in fact, I mentioned it yesterday at the workshop. I said, uh, there was a question about flexibility, right? And flexibility and strength, and there is some give and take there. And you know, if you're really trying to like push into that flexibility far more, um, then say what you're discipline really needs mm. you're probably gonna lose some strength. And uh but to do that you have to be consistent. There's no there's no I think I said it three or four times yesterday, no magic sauce. There's no secret sauce. It's it's consistency, it's dedication. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's everything. Yeah. Right. I talk about it and I talk about it in in, in my free training day session yesterday. Uh, what I in my very nerdy way am, am referring to is the, the universal progress equation. Safety, discomfort, frequency, duration. Right? You have to have those four things to make any sort of progress. And, and people try to find it. somehow a lot of us, and especially in martial arts, we, we think that if we, we can abandon safety, lean heavier into discomfort, and get rid of frequency. <laughs> like the math doesn't work on that, right? Like you, you, you need all of those things to make any kind of progress, and people just stop showing up. And when you stop showing up, you stop making progress. Like it's not. I feel that that removal of safety, though. There, there's there's a lot of that amongst a lot of different disciplines yeah. where they just go, we're just going to work even harder through things that we shouldn't even work through. Yeah. And work until it breaks, right? Yeah. And I mean, it happens inherently, like in, in strongman or powerlifting or anything with heavy, heavy weight, right? Inherently, it is such a dangerous, what we're doing is dangerous. It yeah. just simply is. When, yeah. when you're lifting two, 300 pounds over your head, you know, that's that's a dangerous People thing. die all the time, right? Um, not necessarily. Right. I, I, I don't think I would. <laughs> in general, like, oh, that's right. 300 pounds thing fell right. over my head, right. I die. Um, but yeah, like, uh, a good example, uh, World's Strongest Man, I forget what year it is, Brian Shaw uh, is doing a keg over bar, right? He throws, and it was funny because we all say. Describe for, for yeah, sure. I know what that is, but right. Right. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so just take a, a smaller, not a, a full size keg, but a small pony keg or whatever they're called. Um, they're filled with a little bit of sand. I think the, the weight, or not actually, I think the weight of the keg itself is enough. I think it's like 55 pounds. And it, it it's, in, it's going back to an homage to Highland Games. So, Highland Games. The weight is a steel weight, and it's about probably that big, about maybe eight inches in diameter, maybe yeah. something like that, maybe six inches, maybe smaller. Um, but it's tall, a little bit taller. It has a ring in it, and mm. you, you you back to the bar, right? So you swing it through your legs, lift it, throw it behind you over the bar as high as you can, like a high jump bar or a pool ball bar, right? Yeah, like a but much much higher, like yeah. fifteen feet in the air. Um, what str like modern strongman has done is take that and we do sandbags with two hands or kegs with two hands. And this was a world's strongest man when uh, Brian Shaw was uh, probably 10 years ago, maybe. Uh, and Brian Shaw is a four times uh, world's strongest man. He's a monster. He's he a cube of the human being. Yes, he is six, six, eight, six, nine, gigantic, very nice man, like fantastic person. Uh, I met him uh, once. And 
he was he was nothing but gracious, very very cool to meet him. But um, he took the the keg, threw it over, and just kept going to get the next keg, and the keg came down, hit him right in the shoulder, and he just shrugged it off. Right, so just just absolutely just like oh whatever. That's, not, that's a different kind of right. person. Zadrina uh, Savickas, uh, I think it was Zadrina's. Um, if I'm wrong, it's fine. But he did. It was a stone loading out with stones. So the big round stones that we lift onto the platforms. Right. He took this was also during the strong span. Took the stone, to, couldn't quite get up over the lip, and then fell backwards and started landing on his chest and bounced off. Right. So. Like stuff like that. That's what I'm talking about. Like it's inherently dangerous. Like if you just make one misstep. Um, luckily, I don't think I've ever really hurt myself, other than maybe some lower back injury. Um, but yeah, it's uh, we take the safety out, and then we just kind of push through it. But the you know, I, I think I don't think there's a, anybody who's done strength sports has ever said that you can't have frequency. Like you have to have the frequency. You have to keep going. You have to be even when you're dead like you don't want to do it it's one of those days where you're just like i you know i'm not going to get in the gym you just have to make yourself do it but yeah and there, there's some you know we're, we're getting some interesting stuff coming back around frequency of training because you know what, what we're all exposed to on social media the majority of those folks are on some manner of performance enhancement mm -hmm. and people a lot of people that are not in the strength uh disciplines don't understand they, they assume that you know, if you're taking some kind of anabolics, that that is what's making you stronger, and it's not. It's the fact that it shortens your recovery time, so you can train more frequently, so you can have more frequency, and that's how you're getting stronger. And but lately, is it what's his last name, like Metzger, the guy who was really big on one, you know, like one crazy heavy set once a week. Oh, he's his stuff because he was a. a I think he holds the record for having the best Olympia show ever. Gotcha. His material's been, been getting a lot more attention lately. And so I, I find it interesting people are talking about, finally, we're talking about frequency. We're not just talking about what movement are we doing. Right. Yeah. And, you know, this into this into this, but, you know, some of these other pieces. Right. That are, it's interesting you say that about the, you know, the, the one rep once moving forward. You know, and th that's, that's actually, it's not new as far as I know. Um, if my knowledge, it may be skewed. Like uh, one, one of the guys is the Maya guy. Can, can one of you fact check me on that? That would be awesome. One of them is the, is the Mr. Olympia, and one of them is in our space, and my brain refuses to, to make sure who is who, and I'm embarrassed. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not sure. But, That's uh, okay. But Paul Anderson, yeah. uh, very famous strongman. The very, I would say, probably one of the first modern strongmen. Um, he was you know, for, for doing that, for just doing, you know, very small amounts of reps, then long rest periods, yeah. super long rest periods. And, you know, we, from a training perspective, that's exactly what we do, right? Like we say, if you want to build strength, you have this rep range, right? Three, six reps, somewhere around there. And then you do it for, you do that, and then you have a longer rest period like two three minutes rather than you know every minute on the minute right yep. or hypertrophy training where you're doing you know eight to twelve reps and you're doing you know yep. emo every minute on the minute so, yeah a little different it takes generally three to four minutes for, for glycogen to replenish right and exactly you need that time yeah yeah so it's a, yeah interesting that we can talk about so let's let, 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 <laughs> let's do this we've got, we've, you know we're a few minutes in we've got to hook people in and, and make sure they do you find Menser? Yeah, Menser was the one who would go one once a week. Okay, yeah, one Mike Menser is, is the, name sounds the Olympia guy. Mike Metzger, apologize, my apologies, sir, is the guy who's actually in the martial arts space, helping gotcha. martial arts schools. If, if he was not in our space, I, I would have I, I would have just kind of let it roll, but gotcha. don't want to be disrespectful. So yesterday, a free training day, you did a session about ballet. Yes. And before we go there or anything else, I think we need to talk about what are the physical, we've talked about strongman. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you've done some ballet. Yes. What are the other movement things that you do or have done? Like, it's kind of varied. It's just, well, it, uh, we, can go, we can go all the way back. Let's go all, all the way back. All the way back. Well, I got into ballet uh, when I was, 
when I was pretty young, I really wanted to do gymnastics. Um, I loved it every every time I got a chance to watch um, the Olympics. It was one of those things I just you know I just gravitated to. Really loved gymnastics, and there was no there was no outlet for me when I was a child. And um, the only real outlet being in a small town uh, as an as an adolescent. Um, was we were in a, I grew up in a, a small town in Kansas after moving around the United States. Uh, my dad was a nuclear engineer in the 80s, so a lot of nuclear plants were yeah. Yeah, going up and going down. Uh, finally found uh, Burlington, Kansas, where I uh, grew up from age about second grade, uh, moving forward. And it's a small town, right? A town of like 3,000 people, mm -hmm. maybe less now. Um, but there was no real outlet for gymnastics. There was, however, for games. There was a local, you know, it's a small town, so you usually have a local dance studio. Right. So um, started really thinking about that as I was getting into my teenage years. I said, oh, I, you know, I like dance. It's also something I really like to do. And just tried. And my sister was 100 percent into it. Mm. So and she was quite good. And uh, I just was doing stuff with her. And I was like, oh, I can't do this. And I was like, all right, well, great. I'll start taking class, start taking classes. Um, Did there other boys in there? No, uh, there was one other man in our area that was doing it, uh, who actually was my first martial arts instructor. Okay. So he owned the dojo that was like a block away, right? And Alan was my first, you, you know, my first teacher of, of martial arts um, in uh, Gojuryu Karate. And uh, well, I, I, it was one of these. I was going to dance. Realized I could use some more balance training that I could really probably get from the martial arts. Plus the martial arts were also something that I was interested in. So it was like a crossover, yeah. a really cool crossover I could see. And he offered to teach me. How old were you at that time? 14, 15. And so I was, I was dancing locally, taking classes at, you know, at his school. Um, and really that that's in, in high school. And as I was getting into high school, I, I'm, I don't like team sports. I've never liked team sports. Um, I think it's a control issue for me. Um, it's not that I don't like the team. I love, I love the, the idea of, and, you know, when teams do come together, it's fantastic. It's a really great feeling. But I think for me, it's like, I can't control if that actually happens. Mm -hmm. So I, I really focus in on individual sports. So I was a jumper. Sprinter, um, I did some distance, uh, but that's really where you know, where I could control it. When I, when, when I was in control, doing like long jump or high jump, that's where I felt most free. You, so, you stood out on your own merits, right? Right, and it was funny because I I still hate running, I hated running back then. <laughs> but it's, there's so it's such a long period of my life where I was a runner, um, you know, in and high school. Distances. Uh, well, the longest distance I've ever done is basically a half marathon. Um, it's a long way for someone who doesn't like running. Yeah, right, right. right? Like, <laughs> I was thinking about this. Well, my longest run ever is four miles. Yeah, I did That's, it once. You did once. See, well, let's let's get to that. So <laughs> I, I hike. Give me, give me, you know, throw fifty pounds on. Yeah, my back right. And I'll do 10, right. 12 miles. But Rock marching at a, at a more chill pace. Yeah. Uh, no, so I, you know, I, I don't know if I just, it was kind of the brutality of it, like just having to push myself through it and just go, this is going to make me better. Just do it. Just get it out of the way. And then at the end of the day, you know, it didn't kill you. You're fine. So I went into that, really got heavy into dance, actually to the detriment of track, track and field. Um, I actually pulled out of uh, the 4 by 100 team. Because um, I was pretty quick. I was pretty quick in high school. Not, you know, state record level or anything like that. But uh, Good enough to be on the region. Good, yeah, good enough to, to be, you know, yeah. So I uh, actually pulled out of, of track and field my last my senior year to focus in on dance. And what I was doing is I was trying to, uh, like myself and another a friend of mine, were uh, doing uh, uh, swing dance, and, which culminated into an actual swing dance show with the band. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was actually pretty cool. And I was doing theater, and I really wanted to go that direction. Like, I really saw myself, oh, I'm going to go into 
and I was singing. Um, so I was, you know, doing the vocal side of things, dancing, theater, triple threat kind of things. Like, this is where I'm going to go with my life. And that's where I went. And I had a couple of options for, for college. Um, I really wanted to go to the East Coast. I wanted to go to North Carolina School of the Arts. My parents were like, absolutely not. You're not going that far. That was just kind of off the table. Um, I, French University in Wichita, Kansas had a ballet program. And Emporia State University, which is very close to home, uh, 30 minutes for Burlington, um, they offered me a full scholarship. And sure. it was not because no. they didn't have a dance program. They had no dance. They had no, they had music, but it was, it, they didn't have a musical theater program. Okay. So, like, if they had had a musical theater program, I probably would have, like, a, and by program, I mean, at, at least as far as I remember, and I'm sorry if I get this wrong, but um, I believe they didn't have a bachelor's of musical theater. Okay. So French University did. They had a bachelor's in musical theater and they had a bachelor's in ballet. And because that's where my roots were with ballet, I was like, okay, this is that's where I'm going to go. What were you hoping? Because it, it sounds like even at that time, yeah. you're thinking through what you might do with these things. What were? What was the goal? My my goal with? was to go to New York and okay. to dance on Broadway. That was the goal. I mean, uh, it slowly changed into, do I really want to dance on Broadway or do I want to be a backup dancer for Britney Spears kind of thing? Like, yeah. you know, and so, you know, my mind went a couple different places. But I was I looking at, you know, I, I got I to gotta, I gotta, I gotta yeah. ask a question I've never sure. asked on this show because anybody who's watching, you were a large man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Were you a large man then? I was not. Okay. I mean, my height was the same, right? Sure. So 5'10, so uh, but when I graduated high school, I was about 100. Okay, so I was very so that's less than I weighed. That's right. long and lean. Yeah. yeah, I was very lean. Um, in fact, uh, I got bullied in high school, and one of those was about the fact that I was so lean. Yeah. Right, I, there was no muscle mass on me a lot. So, and I, and which didn't help the fact that I was in dance because at the time in the '90s, resistance exercise and dance didn't really go together. Um, and they did, obviously. But there was still a belief in the 90s that if you worked out, if you got stronger, you got were going to lose money. And you were going to get paid, right? Yeah. And like there is, we, we were actually just talking about this before we started the podcast, that there is a give and take of flexibility and strength, yeah. right? But it was overinflated in my mind. And you've Not, got plenty of counterexamples like Juju Mufu, John Call, who's been on this show. Right. Oh, nice. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, um, who was I talking to uh, uh, specifically about Juju Mufu? I think it was actually. If you guys uh, don't know who who, who Juju Mufu is, uh, go go check him out. Absolutely. Uh, go back and check out that episode. I, I I don't remember what episode number that was, but he he trained up to Green Mill or something. Yeah, yeah. I caught him on another show and I reached out. I was like, you need to come on because you're an amazing, ridiculous person. Absolutely. And you have a martial arts background, so come on. Yeah. He he. Uh, it's great. So I I just recently got the chance to go to. Strongest Man, um, 2024 as a spectator, cool. and uh, in uh, Brutal Beach. Nice. So, oh, that's where the, the, the shirt. Yeah, that's yeah. where the shirt. Okay. Yeah, yes. uh, but I met him. I met Gigi was there, and uh, I, it was really funny because I was like, "Holy crap! I've got to get a picture." I didn't get any like really any chance whatsoever to talk to him. Uh, but it, it was my uh, my director at uh, Circus Scorpius, uh, Kelsey. She actually, her and I were talking about. Affected. And, and I apologize if you never really said this because I don't remember exactly whether whether or not Juju Mufu said this verbatim or you know if I'm paraphrasing, but said that there is some you know the give and take between strength and and, uh, and flexibility that he would have to work through his flexibility in the real life some strength was lost. Uh, but if nothing else, there's a there's a time component. Well, right. Yeah. Right? If, if yeah. you're gonna get good at something, that takes some time. If you want to be really good, there's right. a diminishing rate of return on that time investment. So to be anybody who knows his body type, he is both insanely flexible and insanely strong. Yeah, and there are only so many hours in the day. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and when we talk about consistency, you, you know, yeah, some of that that's lost. Yeah. So yeah, I, I ended up deciding to go to, to friends on a I was on a partial scholarship for ballet. I was on a partial scholarship for um, for my voice. Um, I was a second tenor with the the uh, singing Quakers, and uh, and I was uh, I I went I did my thing I was very unfocused, mm. um, 
I, I didn't really, and you know, not to go too deep, right? But I didn't really, didn't really understand the amount of trauma I had as a kid growing up in my household with my parents until getting into college and realizing just how unfocused I was and how I just did not know how to navigate like an average person, right? So uh, it didn't go well. Mm. Uh, I being so unfocused, I my academics went down the drain, really was unfocused in ballet too and in singing. Um, I was on stage a few times. I, you know, uh, there were some great roles that I absolutely adored. Um, I was Snoopy and I think you're a good, good man, Charlie Brown. Um, got to be on stage. I got to work with uh, some amazing choreographers. Uh, Dominic Walsh, uh, he opened his own um, uh, dance company. I believe he was with, I'm not even going to guess, he was with maybe Houston Ballet uh, before that. But, um, Amazing choreographer, amazing dancer. Um, got to work with him. Uh, got to meet and work a little bit with Wendy Whelan, uh, New York City Ballet. She came in as a, as a guest artist to dance the Nutcracker, um, but she did do some uh, my new choreography with it. I, I'm not sure if I was really part of any of that, but you know, getting to see her and you know, just have her the essence of such a, um, a professional ballet dancer that's you know at her caliber. Like that's that was amazing. So some really great things came out of it. Um, but I 9/11 happened, and coming from a household that was long history of military, I said, I think it's my time. Went to the recruiters, and did that did that come from you, or was there outside influence? <sighs> And direct there was, outside. Were there, were there conversations? There, there were conversations. There were conversations of, oh, Wyatt, you're you're too soft. There's no way you'll ever be able to do this. It and wasn't I, encouraging. It was, no, it, it was, was never some, encouraging. Some, some reverse psychology. Yeah. And I, I vividly remember that being said. Uh, the, I think the, I'm going to still paraphrase. I'm probably not going to get it right. But I think it was something to the fact that they're going to eat you alive. Mm -hmm. And I went, Okay, <laughs> and I doubled down. Because what, what, what I'm hearing is you've talked about the things that you've done, and, and, and you even you even said something that, that I, I wish I had committed to memory better yeah. about embracing hard things. Yeah, yeah, right. And that sounds like something that because any, anybody who who dances beyond the age of about six, yeah, has to enjoy doing difficult things. Yeah, right. Uh, anybody who has worked in theater knows that there's an intensity that happens there that starts pretty darn quickly in rehearsal for a show. If you're singing beyond casually, right, there's an intensity. We're talking about martial arts and, and um, you know, there are some martial arts that have a stereotype for being maybe a little more casual than others. Goju is not one of them yeah. in my experience. Yeah. And so I, I, I would imagine that if I knew you at this, you know, roughly age 20, mm -hmm. that one of the last things I would expect would be for you to not be able to embrace another difficult thing. Yeah, I uh, I think what people saw in me is that I do wear my emotions on my sleeve, and I'm I'm in the very I'm very sensitive to other people's emotions. I'm sensitive to my own. Um, I think that just came through just far more than what people were expecting at that time. And you have uh, one sibling, or older sister, younger sister, younger sister. Yeah, she was younger. Oh, okay. So she was younger. Not what I would have expected. Exactly, right, right, right. So, um, yeah, she was younger and doing it. And by this time, uh, so this is, I'm 20, she's 15, she's being recognized, and my parents are actually taking her to Topeka, uh, which is an hour away to dance, and like pre-professionally. Um, but yeah, so I, I uh, doubled down on it. And that's when I said, all right, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm going in, and uh, going into uh, when I I walked into the recruit, I was so arrogant. I walked into the recruit. I really really wanted to be in the navy. Like, I wanted to be on the ship. I wanted to be able to see the world, right? And they were never there. They were never at the recruit. <laughs> and I, so Marines were always there. Army was always there. And I walked into the Marine Corps because my dad uh, was a Marine. My dad's passed because he's uh, passed four years ago now. But sorry, uh, but he uh, he was a Marine, and I remember. Him saying to me, don't join the Marine Corps 
it was hell, right? That's what I remember. I'll get back to that. So <laughs> he, uh, so he was a Marine. He, 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 he was a Marine during Vietnam, but he, he volunteered. So he wasn't drafted. He was, he was a volunteer. I don't know the percentage. Pretty low. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I went to the Marine Corps and I was like, well, I'd really like to do this. And they were like, absolutely not. We don't care. That's not what, you, that's not why you joined the Marine Corps. You joined the Marine Corps to get Marine. I was like, you guys are full of yourselves. So I walked out and I went to the army and I was like, hey, all right, this is what I want. And they're like, we can make that happen. Of course, like any what reason, you uh, military intelligence, I wanted to language. So, um, and they will, you know, I was like, I want to talk to your clearance. I want to, you know, military intelligence, that's what I want to do. Like, oh, we'll make that. Like any recruiter will, right? My recruiter was absolutely decent. Don't get me wrong. Um, I, I actually didn't get, you know, steered in a bad direction, but I uh, ended up going up to, to MAPS, scored, you know, it was, it was actually kind of funny when I took my ASVAB. Uh, you get like three or four hours to do it, right? And I walked in and, and I've always been an academic person. Like I, I have enjoyed academia. I actually really love learning um, in an academic setting. And uh, uh, yeah, it was just, you know, I've always been that, that kid. And I walk in the ASVAB, I sit down, 30 minutes later, I'm done. I stand up, and it's electronic at this point, it's not paper. And I go over, and I'm like, okay. And they're like, do you need a break or something? Like, no, 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 I'm done. And they're like, what? <laughs> they're like, okay, let me check. And they check, but then they, you know, answer all the questions and went through it. And I'm like, oh, okay, go sit down. And I scored high enough, they're like, okay, yep, yeah, you can do whatever you want. So I went to a career counselor, career counselor was like, all right, you need to be on Broadway. Because I scored so high, in my, uh, in my PT. Physical training. We're like, yeah, be in Lembra, be in Ushery. Yeah, Lembra. We can imagine that we can't do military intelligence. Right. So they're like, yeah, be in Lembra, be in infantry. I'm like, no, that's not what I want. And I had to actually get up. Uh, you know, sorry, this is not for me then. Mm -hmm. Once. And then he was like, all right, fine, well, we'll kind of do what you want to do. And he laid out three different jobs. You can be an underwater welder, scuba diver. With the army, you can be counter intel, or you can be at that time it was called it um, 98 X ray. So it was signals intelligence analyst or um, or uh, uh, linguist, right? And with language, like you'll you'll, you'll get sent to TLI. That was the test of language. Sorry, I'm going to use acronyms during this, okay. and you're going to have to stop me and say stop using yeah, acronyms. I, I, I yeah. will stop you. Uh, Defense Language Institute out of Monterey, California. So and I went okay well. And I kind of kicked myself, wish I would have done the, the scuba diver route, right? Um, but uh, I was like, yeah, that's not for me. And then I was like, counter intel, that's what I'll do. I'm like, well, you'd have to leave in three days. And I'm like, what now? <laughs> I said, mm, okay, what about the 98 x ray? And they're like, oh, you'd be deferred for, I don't remember, I think it was like almost three months. So this is like 2000, the end of 2001, right? This is like, this is probably like end of September or October, right? And uh, people like, who are younger may not remember. Yeah, so this is in the country, yeah. September, yeah. October of 2001. I remember. Yeah, yeah. so 9 11, September 11, 2001. You know, I, I truly just was all in. I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. And it was October. I think it was November or December when I signed that paperwork, right? And then I left in January. And I ended up deciding to do the 90 X ray. So, got sent to basic training, graduated basic. Um, at one point during basic training, I called my parents and I was like, you know, just pay phones back then, no cell phones. I mean, cell phones existed, sort of. Um, <laughs> pay phone. You know, yeah, you know, you know, that's right, yeah. They didn't even fold. I think the, 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 the mouthpiece folded down on the one that I got from the basic training, one of those, yeah. So, I, uh, you know, I called my parents. They're like, oh, you're doing okay? I'm like, yeah, it's like uh, Boy Scout camp. <laughs> it was. It was after you get past like the first like few weeks of like hell, you know, where they're just like screaming at you. I'm like, yeah, just uh, don't talk. You're fine. Like, just stay under the radar. Okay. Which I stayed under the radar the entire time until weapons qualification. And I, I was like, this is great. No one's noticing that I'm here. And then I scored a, was either a uh, 38 or 39 out of 40 on my weapons call, which gives you expert. 
and very few people had amazing training. At that time, very few had amazing training and got that. It was me and one other guy. Did you have experience? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, growing up, um, my dad and you know, being on a farm, we, we grew up on a farm. Um, you know, it, shooting was kind of a normal thing. Um, and my dad was actually far superior shot. Like, he was insanely good. Um, so he was always very much like teaching me the fundamentals of rifle marksmanship. So I walked in, you know, understanding how to do the trigger, you know, pull back, like, you know, all of the breathing, you know, all of these things you learn during, during rifle marksmanship. And uh, it was me and one other guy in my company, I think. Yeah, it was in my company. Um, he was ex SWAT. And uh, he got 40 out of 40. I got 39 out of 40. I really don't remember. It was one or the other. And I walk off the range. And my drill sergeant's like, Merriweather, who the is that? And I'm like, right here, drill sergeant. He's like, you've been here the whole time? <laughs> like, yeah, I've got a drill sergeant. I have. Yeah. So um, graduated with honors. Had a basic training uh, with my rifle marksmanship. Went to DLI, uh, did Russian, didn't do so hot, but still, you know, got by enough that I think uh, that, that was not my choice. My choice would have been Arabic. I did not score high enough. Arabic would have seemed more logical for that time. Correct, right? Uh, so, uh, well, honestly, like Dari probably would have been more, but, you know. Um, but, yeah, I, I didn't score high enough on the proficiency test or languages. So you have to score. in this test. Uh, they put you in a room with, this is back when they had tape cassettes, right? They put a cassette in, and you have it's questions, I think they're multiple choice questions, and it was called the um, Defense Language Aptitude Battery. And you listen to this made up language, and it's it had hints of, I remember hints of like Spanish, some like German, um, I think there were like hints of Russian. They just, they add a few languages together and they just make up this made up language. And then you have to figure out what they're trying to say. And I scored high enough that I could get all those category languages like Russian, and Serbo Croatian, and stuff like that, but I didn't score high enough for Chinese and Arabic. So um, a lot of my cohort, uh, they were they were learning Arabic or Chinese. Um, actually, in fact, I don't think I know anybody who was learning Chinese that actually graduated because it's so difficult. Um, but if you if you don't fully graduate, um, you're offered, okay, well, let's take the test for signals intelligence, or uh, sig yeah, so, uh, signals analysis. Okay. They don't even take the test once the test is gone, um, but it's really just uh, pattern finding um, in a matrices, right? So they, they, they basically show you matrices, and you have to find a pattern with them. And I scored incredibly high on that, and they moved me into uh, analyst role. And so I went to Texas, then um, for, for analyst school, and that's another fun story. I, uh, my bunk mate uh, got orders directly to Iraq to be deployed. I got orders to Korea. My background is Russian, his background is Korean. How does that make sense? Yeah, so, so I said, I'm, I'm ready to go. Like, I'm ready to deploy, I'll do it. And we went to our drill, drill sergeant, and Said, hey, we'll just switch. Just switch orders. It's fine. I'll go get ready to deploy. He can go to Korea. That's where he wanted to go. And shut us down. No, not that. Okay. Well, I spent a year in Korea. Got my uh, my duty of choice. At this point, um, I got married, um, and uh, she she was also in the military, in the army. And I decided I wanted to be as close as possible. So uh, she got uh, Savannah, Georgia. Airfield, and that's where I went. And spent my last three years there. And while I was there, back to martial arts, this is where um, I, I started out like, so I was kind of the, you know, odd child getting there. I, the only reason I got orders to Hunter Airfield was because I got uh, station of choice because I was in Korea and because at the time my wife was already there. So I walked in to my first sergeant, my sergeant major, going, basically going, you screw up in any way, 
you're out. So make sure that you go to the third ID, third infantry division, right next door. Um, and that's where you're going to spend your time because the fact that you're here, just because of you know your circumstances, is BS. I went, Great. okay, keep my nose clean. So when I first got there, they were on mission to uh, Afghanistan. Um, it was taking a while for my clearance to go through to get completed through for the states after being in Korea. They and uh, so I was I was not on mission to Afghanistan. So instead, I became the unit armor and was mixing and cleaning all the weapons and working for the in the administrative area. Got to know my my first sergeant really well. Um, built up a good relationship. Finally, got to go on mission um, on our missions to South America, and then I got stop lost, uh, which means the army says, "Sorry, you're not going to get out when you when you wanted to." Your contract said because your contract actually said eight years, regardless of what your active duty time says. So I stop lost for a year for Iraq. But during that time, uh, when we were not on mission, I got sent. Uh, my first my first sergeant came up to me and he said, "You have a history of martial arts, right?" And when I was in French University, I also took Taekwondo. And when I was in Korea, I took Taekwondo. Okay. And uh, which that was a that was a, it was rough. It was very militant. Um, the South Koreans do not mess with you. No, no. They, it was this. Well, sorry, on a, on yeah, yeah, this is, yeah, yeah. So I was learning from uh, they're called Katusas, uh, Korean Army, something, something, something. Anyway, so the Katusas have their own section, and we were learning from them. And yeah, it was cool. Anyway, so uh, yeah, uh, he's like, you have some martial arts background. I was like, okay, sure. How would you like to become the modern army, modern army cadet instructor? Because at this time, the army was taking. Uh, a lot of cues from, from the Marine Corps, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the McNabb program, yeah. right? Because the, the Army was just going, okay, this is how you deal with the bayonet, this is how you deal with the knife. And there was no, there was no integration juxtaposition of any martial art, like real martial arts, to how you deal with what's really going to happen to you if you don't have a weapon, mm -hmm. right? And so the, the the answer to that was Army, modern Army combatives program, and they were like, at this time it was pretty new. Um, Instructors were pretty far and few between, and it was it was an elite thing to be able to get sent, just like going to airborne school or going to air assault mm -hmm. school. You get sent to. Uh, did they have that same level of, of? Did people look up? Yes. At, at that time, now, as far as I understand, it's far more uh, like that. The instructors are. are it's more like. A, being a combat lifesaver, which everybody was a combat lifesaver kind of thing. I think it's just, it's flowed out and everybody has the opportunity to do it. But back then it was, they were talking about, oh, like airborne air assault have their own pin, right? Combat, uh, combative instructors were gonna have a belt buckle that you got to wear with your uniform. So um, I went uh, to level one, which was real wake up call. Like I had been, I had never really been in a like fight fight, right? Everything was always in a controlled environment. Um, after that, unfortunately, I've been in a few bar fights. But at that time, it wasn't really, I had never really had that situation where I was like, oh, I'm, I might get really hurt. And violence is a whole different breed from martial arts. Yeah. And People. that, yeah, exactly. Like, we were talking about the difference between like um, recreational martial arts and like, what, it, what combative entails, right? And uh, so I, I, uh, I got sent for level one, and it was one of the hardest things I have ever done in my life. It was As someone who, up to that, had done quite a few hard things. You know, there's a recurring thing yeah. here. It was, it, it was such a great feeling at the end of that. It was, it was only, it's a week. It's 40 hours of training. But you get in there day one, they talk to you for a little bit, and then it's game on, and you're rolling. So more Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? So you're rolling on the floor for eight hours to the point where when you when we got to lunch, like the second day was sort of when it hit. Like I went to lunch and I was like, okay, I got to eat something. I could not stomach food. I had to buy those little pouches, those carb pouches, yeah. and I had to eat that and then drink water and eat that and just try and stomach that down. By like day or three or four, 
I don't know if you've ever smelled the smell of like when no one's, they're no longer burning uh, spat, but you're burning muscle, the ketone yeah. smell. That's what the smell was. And, you know, everybody's just like burning everything off. And uh, at the end of it, I open up the bay door and I go, okay, to pass, you have to get to dom upper, like dominant body position standing, right? Which is like whether or not you get like a seat belt or a double, un you know, underhooks. And you have to hold that for 10 seconds. You are not allowed to strike. The person you're up against is allowed to hit you as hard as they want. And these are the level three guys that most of them are probably infantry, right? Or some kind of combat arms. And they're... So they've they got, they've got a plain experience in this program. Yeah. And they're big rugged dudes yeah. who like mixing it up. Yeah. And they get to hit you as hard as you they can. Want. And we can't hit them. We right. just have to gain dominant body position. And uh, a friend of mine who was there, he actually got knocked down. Uh, they thought he got knocked out. Um, I got pinged pretty pretty good right in the center of my forehead, um, and they, they they actually said, "Hey, you know, if you run out, you're done." Mm -hmm. But we understand if it's if it's too much for you, you can run out that door. That's why they opened the bay door. And uh, yeah, we all we all did it. I think I think we did actually lose a couple people during that door. They're just like, "I'm out. I can't do this." And uh, yeah, when we got through it, uh, the guy the last one, you have to do it. It's not just once. You have to do this three times. Now you have to do it, and it's one after another, right? So you're in a line. You're lined up. And like, okay, let's go. Um, and there's other things you have to prove that you can do, um, you know, on the ground. But that's that was the most memorable, right? And uh, I do it the last one. That's where he hits me, like right, right on the crown of my head. Um, I, my head goes back, and I re-engage. I get it. And it was funny. Steve up to me and I was like, I thought I killed you. <laughs> and, then, and then you came up and you just like shook it off and it went forward. It was like, I have never seen anybody do that before. And I was like, well, you know, when you have to, when you have to do something, right? So, uh, yeah, it's that, that really getting, you know, getting put to that situation and seeing like how the instructors were just mixing it up, you know, when we weren't doing anything, they were like, all right, no gloves. And they were doing full contact and, you know, reducing that safety just for the, even the machismo of it, right? Um, so I, I graduated level one, they sent me back for level two, um, and by the time I was gonna get set for level three, uh, that's when stop loss and deployment happened. So I, I came away with level two, which is awesome. Uh, I was able to ref, um, you, you get the, the ability to referee uh, modern army combatives. Um, uh, you know, competition, competition or, yeah, yeah, however you want to do it. I ran one with my battalion, um, got to got, gain the respect of my sergeant major, finally, after going through all this, my sergeant major was, I mean, he was the hardest of the hard ranger, you know, and uh, yeah, it was, it, it was one of those, one of those things I came away with, like, that, that level of difficult, right, and I'm sure it's, Changed quite a bit now, but you know, we actually got sent to Fort Benning for this. This was not, you know, oh, we, this this instructor guy is going to do it. You know? Yeah, this was you go to Fort Benning, you go to TD, uh, TDY, uh, temporary duty assignment, and uh, yeah, it was it was a ride. And uh, came out, I, I had some thoughts of maybe I'll I'll fight recreationally, like competitively. Um, got into one too many bar fights in those situations just because I have a smart mouth. And uh, I was also, to let you know, you know I, had a, uh, I did have a problem with alcohol for a long time. Mm. It stemmed from uh, some of the trauma that I had. And, uh, no, it's surprising given the art of the things that yeah. you were talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. Intense, right? Yeah. The people, people who casually embrace things rarely have problems with substances. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the intense folks, the all in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we talked, I talked about that, it's funny, all in, talked about that quite a bit. But got out of the military, um, really wanted to finish my degree in dance. Really wanted to go that route. Hmm. I wanted to go How long had it been since you stepped out at that point? Six years? years? Yeah, about six years. I was 27. Yeah, so 27, great shape. I was in fantastic shape. So basic training, I put on about 20 or 30 pounds of muscle. So, and I kept that up. Um, I got a little fluffy. Uh, when we were, you know, being intel, we're sitting down at 
the desk kind of thing. Um, got a little fluffy. I think I went up to like 180. I dropped down to about 168. Um, coming out of out of the military, it was in great shape. Could see my abs, fantastic. You know, I was ready to go. Doing handstand pushups like nobody's business. Um, and that's what I want to do. I want to finish my degree in dance. Potentially, like, oh, maybe I could dance or. Maybe I go to med school. Like, what am I going to do? My first thought was, I'm going to do all of my stuff for med school. Because mm-hmm. I really, I was a combat lifesaver. Um, I, I really liked healthcare. But I w- it was also very, um, I, it wasn't realistic. Like, my, my viewpoint of what goes on in healthcare was not a realistic view. And... Uh, so I was, you know, I was discussing, you know, at this point too, I was also getting divorced. There was a lot going on. Um, my drinking got pretty bad. Um, but through it all, <laughs> again, through all this, this crazy unfocusedness, I was really able to focus on getting my degree, getting it done. And, you know, got hurt a couple times, like I said, just from stupid situations that I should have never been into or fractured my, uh, my orbital my nose yeah um got told by an ent like you get hit like that again it's you know pretty bad so I kind of stepped away from martial arts for a while and uh really focused in on dance and then uh got the opportunity to do this really cool cross train with it was 940 dance company at the time uh out of florence they were a professional company and then i was working with um with one of the adjuncts who, who does uh, uh, medieval dance. Hmm. So, like, all the dances in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Right? So, going back way to, you know, the precursors to, like, the square dance, right? And I ended up doing this this professional show with 940 uh, out in Clinton Lake, uh, Lawrence, Kansas. And I was like, this is going to be great. I'm going to audition for 940. And that didn't quite work out how I wanted. It did get kind of the, the offer to, hey, you can uh, come in as, as a guest artist you know, every once in a while, but it just it wasn't on the cards. And I was like, okay, well, I got to do something else. <laughs> I got to figure it out. I'm not going to be a retail manager. Um, I I want you know I didn't want to move up into just management and, and do retail the rest of my life. That's not that just wasn't me. Had you been doing retail? that's what I've been okay. doing. Yeah, I've been doing that. I I also my parents really wanted me to be an attorney. They wanted me to be a lawyer, and I was working also as a as, um, a law clerk, basically, at a, at a local uh, legal office. And that was also like, I don't want to do that either. Um, like, this is just not what I wanted to do. And uh, nothing against either. Like, lawyers, you know, being in being management, you know, that's, that's great. Um, I just I didn't really want to do it. So I was like, well, what can I do with this? Like, I can go, you know, the business route. Maybe do finance, do something like that. Uh, maybe healthcare, but in administration. So I went, got my MBA and my uh, Master's of Human Resources in both degrees, um, and then focused on the hospital administration. Did an internship where I basically didn't get paid um, for the VA, mm-hmm. and then got into a position there. And I've been um, with now with the VA since. Mm-hmm. And uh, during that time, I realized I got back into management, right? And that's where that kind of went. I didn't really understand, like, what that what that was going to entail. I, you know, because I was thinking, oh, I need to be, like, risk management, things like that. That's not where this was going. So I went, absolutely not. I've got to get my, I've got to do something else. And I decided to get my PhD. Mm-hmm. And, and I've always wanted my PhD. Like, that was, like, a common chance. No. It, well, actually, yeah. So okay. that uh, when I was when I was at KU when I finished my, my dance degree, um, I was kind of set on if I could afford it, if I could just go out to California and do it um, to get my my PhD in dance history, and then you know go into a professorship and go that way. Didn't work out. I just you know I'm I'm I was at that point used to a certain level of income. Um, I was also you know at that point taking care of my parents. Um, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't on the cards. So, and I've always been that science minded person, right? Even in the military, military intelligence being a signal intelligence analyst, like what I like to do is analysis, geospatial, what I learned quite a bit on was fantastic. Like I, I have that mind 
And, you know, it, it, I hadn't been using it for a while. And I'd also always been arguing to myself, like, is the, are the arts really what I want to do? Like, am I really giving back to the world by being an artist? And that side of my brain was like, absolutely not. You need to be a scientist. So I was able to get into a program, uh, non-funded PhD in public health and epidemiology, and realized that's truly quick. As far as science is concerned, that's what I want to do. And that's where I am now. So I finished my PhD um, in epidemiology, and I now work um, in population health. So, okay. Yeah. So we that's never, my. That's never my imagined you ended up you end up there. Yeah. Right. Like all these twists and turns that you took, and you know, I, I could I could reverse engineer your your personality, right. Like, right? Like coming in from the end, but I didn't see that coming. Yeah, uh, it's not the first time. Uh, you know, I, I talk about what I do, and, and people are like, where did that come from, from dance? You know, because that was such a huge part of my life for so long. And the military, right? I could have I could have stayed in. I had the options to stay in. I was given, I was actually given some pretty good options to actually learn Indonesian, stay in, and then be uh, attached to SF up in uh, um, Washington State. And I decided not to. I decided that wasn't, you know, I didn't want to stay in, didn't want to continue on. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's my, that's my day job. But during all this time, right? Like I said, I had a, a very, pretty severe problem with alcohol. Um, and I was, I got to the point where I just was done working out, right? So in the army, I was running all the time. That's where the running came from. I, you know, I, they got a hold of me, the fact, oh, you're in track in high school, you need to be on the run team. So it didn't matter what I, what I wanted to do. They were like, you're on the run team, regardless. Doesn't matter that you know one of the slowest guys when it comes to long distance. You're going to be on the run team. So I was on the run team the entire time for DLI, Korea, everything. I was I was running. And after it all, uh, I was just I was done. Like in my mind, I was like, I'm just I'm just done doing this. I want to just take some time off and not be not do anything athletic and just I mean, just relax. And uh, that takes a toll on the body when you're not doing anything. It was a couple of years of that. And then I was like, okay, this is bad. Like, I need to get back in the weight room. Like, so I went back in the weight room and just started lifting. And this was, you know, I'd, I'd been lifting beforehand doing, you know, resistance, but at this point I was like, I'm kidding it. Like, this is, this is going to be it. And uh, this is how I'm going to keep in shape. And that was probably 2000, 2009, like a couple of years, 2010, I think I graduated. Yeah. And at that point, so it was 2010, 2011, 2012, somewhere. Really got him, you know, into the weight room. And then, uh, like 2019, 2018, I was like, I want to go heavy. Because I had always been watching Strongman. So, World's Strongest Man, back in the day, like watching Magnus for Magnus and way back in the day, right? I always watched it. I was like, I'm flipping through the channels on Saturday. Right, the exactly. Kid, and you see that, and yet there's nothing else like it. TV. Right. And it's it's transfixing. You right. can't help but, but watch these people picking up things heavier than you. Right. Or small kids. Yeah. And just hucking them around like they right. weigh nothing. Right. And at the time, like, I'm, I'm a dancer, right? I'm, I'm about, you know, these long, light limbs. And, and you know, it's not about you know, this brute strength, but I'm watching it going, that's amazing. That'll never be me. That's, that, it can't possibly ever be me. But I, I adored it. And I, you know, and I put it on a pedestal. I was like, absolutely, this is like, this is strength. Strength is amazing. But I'm just, I'm not that person, right? I'm, I'm more of the agile, you know, balanced. You know, I, I have, I have great, you know, quickness. That's you're not brute force. You're too smart. <laughs> that too, right? right? Well, in the '90s, that was huge, right? You know, you have the, 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 the oh, what's the, what's the term? Jim Bro, yeah. But back in the nineties, what, what was the term back in the nineties for Jim Bro? It wasn't Jim Bro? It was uh, Musclehead. Yeah, Musclehead. That's close. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that. Yeah, that and, and I'm not saying that in meathead, terms of meathead, 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 muscle. Yeah, meathead. I don't mean yeah. it in terms of judgment. There's no oh no, judgment, absolutely. But that was the broad public perception that right. you only would become big, muscly, strong, and do that sort of stuff if you couldn't right. use your mind. That's right. And what's so insane about that? And and going back to like the Marine Corps, right? people get in the Marine Corps 
because they want to be Marine Corps, they want to be, you know, hoorah, you know, hardcore. It's all about the physical. The smartest people I ever met in the military were not in the Army, they were not in the Air Force. And the Air Force gets this, oh, we're the smartest. Absolutely not. The smartest people I ever met in the military were the Marine Corps. Really? Yeah. And at that point, and that was also too, like, where I was like, there's this tie between being really intelligent and focused and physical activity. And I was like, there is something there. We're starting there's, to understand there's now. got to be something there, right? There is absolutely a tie in there. And I'm looking back, like retrospect, like all of those those student athletes in high school. Like, you know, I was a student athlete, but I was kind of student athlete light. Like I'm talking about the ones that were in football, basketball, wrestling, and then were, you know, uh, honor society, right? I was also honor society, but again, not, you know, I was not, I didn't do everything. I was a swimmer. I was a lifeguard, you know, I love track and field, but it was, you know, I was kind of lensy because I just hate team sports so much, right? So, you know, at that point, I was like, oh, there is, there's absolutely something to this. Um, I was like, well, okay, I'm going to start lifting heavy. This was, you know, I'm now, I'm now well into adulthood. I'm in my 30s. I'm like, I'm going to start lifting heavy. Looking back on, you know, oh, I, I think I might be able to, you know, scratch the surface, right, of all that stuff all that strength sports that I was watching as a kid going and into adulthood. Like I remember being in San Francisco, flipping around, like being in a hotel, flipping on TV. And I was 20, 23, 24 or 22, 22, 23, somewhere in there, 21, 22, somewhere in there when I was at DLI and we were, you know, in San Francisco on leave or whatever. And I'm like, Oh, world's strongest man. Amazing. You know? Uh, but now I'm in my thirties. Like, oh, maybe, maybe I can do it. Yeah, we'll try. And I absolutely fell in love with the process. I found out that I can lift heavy, heavy weight. That all the athletic stuff that I had been doing since I was a kid kind of just set me up for this perfect storm of I haven't gotten injured, severely injured. Like a lot, I was very lucky. But all of this, this the, the biomechanics of what I'm about to do. Kind of just set it up and i was like Ooh. and there's now there's now there's like lots of talk about like uh, pulling sumo deadlift and how ballet being that that extreme turnout that 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 hip turnout that you're almost at infinite level of, uh, of torque you know mm -hmm. of, you know, for, for folks in the audience yeah. who might not know uh your your lifts uh Conventional deadlift, your arms are outside your legs, right? right. So you can stand up and pick up like that. Sumo deadlift, like sumo, right? Your legs are wide, and your hands are inside. Right. So the uh, there's now talk about that, like, oh, you're almost at an infinite ability of leverage, you know, toward to be able to pull that up off the ground when you're when you're at the ability at that ability with your hips. So, which I played around with, this is kind of true. <laughs> like, this is some weights that I've thrown around. I'm like, oh wow, that that was actually felt heavier. Conventional, then, you know, but in strong you know, right? Powerlifting, you can. Um, but I, I've never done a powerlifting meet, um, never trained as a powerlifter, uh, but I've been training strongman now. So, got a strongman, started training myself, realized that's that's a short lived program mm -hmm. when you do it yourself. You've got to find a coach if you're planning on doing this for any length of time or actually really helping yourself. And uh, fell into meeting uh, Matt Walsh with Broward Barbell Center. Florida and uh, became friends and he's he's been training me since and I've been competing um, getting better and better um, you know I'm, I'm over 40 now so there's, there's no there's no thoughts that in my head like oh I'm not a world's strongest man or anything that's not my my goal but right. to be clear most yeah. of the guys at the high level they're not in their 20s. oh no they're not they, they're, they're in their 30s they're yeah. trying to build that yeah. they're absolutely in their they're, they're still, still competing and doing well in yeah their 40s. yeah there's um Brian Shaw, he and I are probably the closest in, in age, or maybe a couple months apart. He just retired. Uh, but there's absolutely like uh, um, who's the who's the commentator? Um, big name Lauren one. Lauren Shelley. No, no. there there was somebody he and maybe he isn't even now, but he was competing yeah. for a long time, even into I believe the mid to late forties. Um, American. Yeah. Oh. Um, Oh well, the strongman community is going to kill me. <laughs> well, that's right. Um, yeah, yeah. Don't tell you're on a martial arts. Yeah, okay, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, you know, I, I, I have my own rules, right? 
I, I, there's, there's things I want to do. Um, I've qualified it now a couple times for USS Nationals. I plan on doing, I mean, I, I haven't actually gone yet. I'm going to go next year. Nice. Uh, plan on it. So I plan on going to USS Nationals uh, next year in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Um, the, the, the big, like, pie in the sky goal is to get a spot to be invited to Amateur Arnold's. Mm. That would be it. Like, that's, that, that would be amazing. Um, and I'm now I'm saying that out loud in front of an audience. So, uh, all right, well there it is. But it's true. Like yeah, I mean, why not? Why not make that pie in the sky goal? So, um, yeah, but I've been thinking about that for, for now years. So I've been competing uh, three years now, three four years. I'm uh, doing okay. Like you know, I'm not I'm not winning a bunch of medals or anything. Uh, I'm fair to middle and strong, right? I'm not definitely not top top tier, but I'm doing okay. Right? And I'm getting stronger. And that's, I just love the process. The process is what I love. I love that it's so hard. And I love the fact that to get better, it's, you're putting on a two and a half pound plate, right? And you're like, I might hit that, right? I might not. And, you know, I, that's what I love about it. I love that it's so difficult. Um, and that it's such a, it's, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. And there's being, so much synergy with that mindset. You know, I, for, for similar reasons, I ended up in, in CrossFit for a decade. And the uh, mindset is so similar to martial arts. And it was, and, and we've got to make sure we talk about how all this stuff relates to your, your martial arts background right. and, and everything. But what I found fascinating was so, how similar the training process was. But the big difference in CrossFit versus martial arts for me, which kicked off so many things that we see within whistle kicked out. CrossFit didn't have the the trappings of well we've always done it this way. Mm -hmm. It was whatever makes the most sense. What's the research telling us? What is? And I suspect you found something similar yeah. in Strongman. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know where you. That's okay. <laughs> so you're 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 continuing a Strongman. It, it's making sense. It's working. Yeah. But here we were yesterday, you know, when, when you were invited to present something at free training day, it wasn't, right. here's how you get stronger. No. It wasn't, here's how you fight. It was, here's what ballet can teach us as martial arts. Right. Why did you go there? So, um, during all this time, right, of uh, going into the strength sports, becoming stronger, I also got my, my personal training cert. Um, Learned quite a bit, actually, and, it's, and I had to take kinesiology and anatomy and physiology in college. And, you know, did still learn a little bit about, you know, human kinetic movement. And I'm always interested. Like, that's something, that's an interest of mine. I've always been I'm reading, I'm, I'm researching, I'm, I'm, you know, looking at what's new. And then taking what, you know, what I've done in the past and what ballet teaches you, from it's very structured. So it's very structured, like a lot of martial arts are, right? It's very structured. Your movements are structured. This is how you do it. A good example being the discussion of um, how do you do a sidekick, right? So do you chamber your sidekick, you know, in front of your body or you chamber the rest of your sidekick with your, with your knee down, right? That's that's very structured. Same thing with ballet and modern, right? Mm -hmm. And modern, when I, for the dancers out there, what I mean is that when modern was created as a uh, breaking of ballet, it, there's still structure, like there has been structure from those modern dancers that um, created their own, like Jose Malone mm -hmm. and the grand, you know, there is still that structure, but the structure is different, right? And then in ballet itself, there's, I, I mentioned this yesterday, you know, Chiquetti, Balanchine, French, uh, Russian, you know, each school of ballet is very different. Mm. So learning this, this, this structure, there's so many similarities between martial arts and ballet or, or any movement, right? It's just movement. Mm -hmm. So how do you move effectively, right? And just taking it from and even with, with lifting, right? So there's there's certain things that we talk about as a, as a personal trainer when like general population, I'm talking to someone who's never touched anything, right? It's like, I just want to get better. Okay, well, let's start start from scratch. Like, let's just have you do a squat, right? And there's certain things that we look for in a squat that we don't want you to do. We don't want to see a huge amount of knee valgus so your knees going in, right? We don't want to see that, right? We don't want to see over, like, this huge overpronation of the feet. We don't want to see a lot of supination. We want to see you know, the legs in line, the knees in line with the feet, right? 
but slightly out, right? Well, that 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 hip, you know, that hip abduction, and then abduction, and flexion, you know, it's all how the body moves. The body moves with a natural pronation, right? So uh, taking that, I went, all right. Well, this is the stuff that we teach in ballet because you can jump higher. We don't teach plies in ballet for plies. We teach plies, the bending of the knees. Okay? We teach plies so that we move fully through the foot and get as ma the, 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 the maximum amount of range of motion as possible in that bent position to be able to jump effectively into the air. That's the purpose of a plie, right? That's why it was developed. Well, how can we take that then and use it for martial arts? How can we get more power? And I did this at KU with the dive team. They asked me to come in and, and, and look at their divers. And it took me about 10 seconds to look at, oh, well, why don't you just think, be mindful of where your knee is over your foot and where you're rolling through and get more height through your dive. And it worked, right? So same thing I was doing with gymnastics at the time too. I was, I was dabbling with, with, with teaching as, as you do, you know, as I, as I do, I should say. Literally, <laughs> as I do. Right, yeah, exactly. I taught gymnastics with right. no background well, in gymnastics. Right. I didn't really have a background in gymnastics, but they, they taught me, right? They taught me. And, and, uh, Sorry, not that. Yeah, no, I did. I got, I got some certifications there, but <laughs> they taught me. Like, take the boys over there and yeah. do something. But, but, you know, it was more from an acrobatic perspective. Right? Right. I knew how to roll, I knew how to fall, yeah. I knew how to, you know, that's, that's the stuff that I, you know, not how to do a, a cartwheel on, on, a, on, a, on a beam. Like, you know, that's not what I was teaching. I, I, I don't know if there's videos out there of me falling on that one. But, you know. Um, I turned the beams into parkour. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that's that, it's those principles, those movement principles, that that's really what that structure is built for. And it's just about vocabulary, right? Yeah. We talk about, like, uh, a good one. In, so I'm going through a, a professional coaching certification right now at work. And it's, it's through the International Coaching Federation to become an associate coach. And um, we're, we're just recently talking about psychometric boot camps, right? So finding your strengths, finding your weaknesses, you know, what, what, what who you are as a person from a, from a psychometric, you know, uh, testing perspective. And um, if you know the history of psychometric exams, they're not, they're not necessarily great. Myers-Briggs being one of those, that, you know, it's, it's not great. But there is something to be said about them, and that is that it gives you a vocabulary that you may not have had beforehand. And I made that point. I said, you know, if, if I'm talking to a coachee and they just don't have the vocabulary of, of who they are as a leader, um, at, you know, in their, in their role, this is going to be a great, great tool, right? Just like anything else that's movement-based, it can give you another vocabulary. So that's what I was trying to do yesterday is say, look, this is, this is why we have the structure in ballet. There's a reason for it. Just like there's a reason for we have structure in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and Judo and, and Karate and, and Taekwondo, there, there's a, there, the structures are there for a reason. And we're all trying to get to the same place just in different ways. And But there are some, you know, some not necessarily rules, but there, there's a modicum of, of similarity, you know, in, in movements. Like when everybody throws a roundhouse kick or a round kick, right, you have hip flexion and you have hip abduction. You absolutely have those two things for sure. Well, then how do we improve those? How do we improve the strength and how do we improve the power through those things? Ballet can be used to focus on the isolation of those body movements to then understand a little bit better, broaden your vocabulary of going, okay, this is how the body is meant to move. This is how, the, and it's different for everyone. Okay, no body is the same. Like, we're not going to say this is the average person. How it works because we all know that you know human bodies are different, but there is a biomechanic similarity that we can use between you know this is how how we move in ballet and then transfer that to martial arts. We'll transfer that to anything. We transfer that to strength sports. So that's where I, I keep that mindfulness and I, I use that. And that's what I was teaching yesterday. And I also use that within uh, now my role as a as a professional circus strongman with Circus Scorpius. Nice. So, so yeah, that's that's like the biggest thing. I have to mention it just because it's the biggest thing. I'm, it I feel like recent. it's very recent. Yeah, yeah very recent. Yeah. I, uh, I, I started teaching a circus dumbbell, so the, the big dumbbells, mm -hmm. um, which is a love-hate relationship. Uh, my 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 coach, um, you know, one of the last things he's, that we were 
working up, I was going to a comp where it was a, it was a bell is was well outside my range of weight. And I was like, ah, if I get one rep, I'll be ecstatic. So like how, how heavy are we talking? Um, not real heavy, but heavy in the amateur, area, yeah. right? So as an amateur, it was 160 pounds. So one hand over hand, right? So um, literally the most I've ever put over my head with two hands coming off a rack. Okay. You know, All as, right. as, yeah. as, a, sure. as a straight press. Oh, yeah. So, you know, there's, that, you know, there's everyone's perspective, right? You know, I, I go, oh, that's not very heavy. Well, in the, in the strongman world, especially in the professional strongman world, that's nothing, right? They're, they're almost lifting, they're lifting well over 300 pounds with one hand in a certain stumbo. Uh, but in the amateur world, 160 is just outside, right? At least I thought. Um, I'm, I'm more at like 140, right? Comfortably as a one rep or maybe two rep max. So he was working with me on my technique. Mm -hmm. And um, I kind of I fell in love with it, like, really how technical that mm -hmm. lift is. And I was like, this would be really fun, really from a circus perspective, right? Teaching kids, teaching adults that have never touched this kind of stuff. Because like, this was, the circus dumbbell exists because of the circus, right? So we have, um, we have this big giant bell because circus strongmen before us were like, this would be amazing if this big piece of freaking iron was lifted overhead. People like, oh, amazing. That's fantastic. We love it. Uh, so I taught a circus uh, dumbbell class for Great Plains Circus Center here. It's actually, I think it is Lenexa. Um, and they they were like, oh, well, you know, and I, I had some discussion about being part of Circus Scorpius, which is a professional company, and invited to, to audition. And that's where I am. So, yeah, first show was actually uh, I've done kind of small shows, like second Saturdays here in, in uh, Kansas City um, at, our, at our location at Great Plains Circus Center. But the first big show was going to be at Glow Wild um, at the Kansas City Zoo. So I'm super excited. I play a pirate. So, that sounds great. Yeah, I'm, I'm bummed. I'm going home. I'm yeah, gonna it's, it's gonna be it's gonna be a ride. So I'm, I'm lifting some, some weird stuff like whiskey barrels, um, big ship's mast, which is really just a giant hole. <laughs> no, stuff like that. But um, yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. That's but okay. I wanted to mention it because it's the newest thing. I feel like I'm getting a second chance. Mm -hmm. So like I never really like I didn't. I didn't go out. I wasn't part of a ballet company for, you know, three or four, 10 years or whatever. That's really where I wanted to go. Right. But I just, it wasn't in the cards. Some would say I'm just, I wasn't good enough. Right. And fair enough. I probably wasn't. Right. Probably. And really what it was is I wasn't focused enough. I didn't, I wasn't putting the time in, but this is like, I've been putting the time in for strength for pretty few years now. And now this is, this is it. This is my second chance and I'm loving it. And no, it's not going to become, my first job, right? It's going to be my my second job, my hobby job. Um, but but you know, I'm I love it, and I'm an all in as I possibly can be, right? With having a family, having a career also in healthcare. Um, but yeah, it's it's a ride, and I'm hoping it lasts for a good long while. Yeah. Fantastic. And being 43, who knows how long that's going to be? <laughs> you got yeah. time. Yeah, right. You got time. And so yeah. the, what, I, what I want to ask. Because there's a there's a theme here that I, I'd like you to share sure. your thoughts with, with the martial artists watching and listening. That I believe diverse movement is beneficial. Yes. Yes. Versatility of movement, and you know we talk about it often on the show that diverse martial artists is generally speaking a better martial artist because mm -hmm. you have more more options that, right. that you can handle more situations. But there's been a big theme in your life around non combat Mm -hmm. diverse motion right can you just speak a bit to how that has i assume a positive impact on martial arts yeah um and, and, and i'll say it another way why should martial artists care about non-combative movement i think it's with anything when we talk about cross training right we can talk about cross training with other martial arts. That's been done. The UFC proved it. You know that when we look at when we mix the martial arts together, you get a more well-rounded martial artist, right? Yes. I mean that. that I'm, that's not. That, that's nothing new to the audience, right? What may be new, and it's really not new. This isn't. This isn't groundbreaking. It's not special sauce either, right? Because we've had, we've we've had power lifters, we've had bodybuilders take, taking ballet. We've had, uh, we have martial artists taking. Um, 
it's it's not necessarily the fact that it's non combative in my mind. In my mind, it's it's again simply a different way of looking at how we move, right? I, I the fact that it's non combative. The only thing I would say about that that to cross train into something that's non combative when you are when you're all in in martial arts, right? If someone is truly all in in that, you're from a um, from from a CNS perspective, so your central nervous system. From a CNS perspective, like just like strength, powerlifting, you get burned. Mm -hmm. Like if you're lifting heavy all the time, you get burned, right? And you just can't handle it anymore. Your body can't handle it. Your body is just probably to keep safe, right? And if you're in constant combat, right? If you're combatives or recreational martial arts, if you're in that 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 fight phase all the time, you, your CNS can get fried. So to take a step back, maybe not back. I'm not going to say back. Hmm, that's not the right word. Sideways, right? And instead of going, this is this is the fight response, but in the non-combative response of movement, how do we move in a non-combative way? I think that alleviates the CNS. And I think that's really what it's done for me, is having both. Like, I can go in, and right now I could probably go into a, to a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gym, you know, role. I'm, you know, I'm out of shape that way, right? <laughs> I'm absolutely out of BJJ shape, but, you know, I'll roll, right? And it'll be hard, it'll be great. I'll come away from that and I'll go, I'm fried, right? Let's go back to something else. Like, I wouldn't, there, I wouldn't dream of going, oh, let's get in the gym, roll for an hour, and let's go lift heavy for an hour, right? Those two things, you can do resistance exercise along with martial arts. I highly recommend it, right? But I wouldn't lift heavy and do a heavy level of rolling at the same time. They're going to be similarly taxing, correct? Even if they are not similar, correct. But if we take um, a non-combative approach to something that's a bit more of just about feeling your body moving in space, right? Nobody, not nobody, but a lot of people miss that, right? Miss the the opportunity to go. How do I walk? I had uh, I had an amazing choreographer. Um, she was with a, a long line of, of artists from Closey Um She came into KU to teach, uh, and she said to me, I want to see how you walk. And she just had me walk around. I saw you doing that in your session. I use it all the time now. Yeah, because yeah, I get to see how people walk in a pedestrian manner. Do people like ballet walk? Are they mostly on their toes? Are they, you know, are they like, is that how they're just naturally walking, or are they moving through the whole foot? And it tells you a lot about how someone can move. Like, are they, are they truly overpronating? Are they truly, you know, there's a lot of overpronation gets thrown around, around a lot. I don't like it because the body naturally pronates. But, um, you know, you can see, like, where everyone is in movement. And it's not just about that from an analysis perspective, right? Seeing that pattern, like reading a person and being able to see, like, maybe where there's some, some deficits or where their strengths are. It's more about them. It's more about giving them power to say, I've never walked around a room, just thought about walking around the room, right? I don't, I've never explored the proprioception of my, my, my body and space. I also brought that up during, during our workshop, like, you know, understanding your proprioceptively, like, you know, I close my eyes and I touch my nose with my, my finger. Like, not everyone can do that really well, right? But just understanding where your body is in space and how it reacts and how it reacts to a floor, how it reacts to a hard floor versus a soft floor, like where you're feeling your muscles. Like, there's something to be said about that. And there's something to be said about that in martial arts, especially in martial arts that, that transition heavily up to floor, like ground to, to stand up by. Like ground to stand up by, I believe, really needs to have that. You need to have a higher level of proprioception and understanding where your body is in space. I don't think anybody's going to argue that, right? But how do you do that? Well, you can use non-combative sense of work to, to get to that space. Ballet, modern, any kind of dance, gymnastics, acrobatics. Yeah, these are all things that you can use. More, more tools in your tool belt. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my hope for, for the audience out there is that you, if, if you're a student, don't be afraid to do some non martial arts. Because it is going to make your martial arts better, uh, especially 
the more you are training martial arts, the more benefit I think you're going to find from dabbling in some other things because you're probably singularly focused. And if you are all in, you're probably a little fried. It's, it, it's, it's right. become cliche in a lot of martial arts circles that you know you train three, four, five days a week and everything's always broken and hurts. That's not how it's supposed to go, right? right? If you're broken and it hurts, stop, do basic yeah. changes. If you're an instructor, and if you're an instructor who works with kids, you see the value all the time of primal movement and doing other things like that. Make the adults do it because they need it even more. Right. It's true. How can people find you? So uh, I have a, I'm trying to keep up a pretty cool social media presence. I try to put stuff up there. Um, I have got some heavy stuff pictures of you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff I've, got, I've got a website too. So my website is uh, www.myheavymetal.com. M E T T L E oh, yeah. dot com. Um, same as at my heavy metal um, on Instagram, and then just my name, Wyatt Merriweather, on Facebook. Um, yeah, and I, I throw up some cool videos every once in a while. Um, I'm an ex photographer too, so I throw some photography. So, yeah. You do everything. I don't do everything. Like I guess that I'm, I'm not a pilot. Uh, yeah. We were talking about that yesterday. <laughs> yeah. But you very quickly got it on. But oh yeah, that's right. So yeah, like I, yeah, I was I thought about throwing in my pack. So in enlisted in, in the army, uh, at least back then, there was an option of hey, you know, you want to throw in your pack and become a helicopter pilot. It was always an option, and I thought about it, started completing my packet, and decided not to. But, yeah. So you can't say you didn't have interest in being a pilot, right? Like for this whole thing. No, I don't, I'm not interested in everything. But. I like being a well-rounded person. I like yeah. I think. I can, it, everyone forgets the, the full quote. Everyone says Jack of all trades, master of none. That's not the full quote. Jack, you know, Jack of all trades, master of none, but better than to be a master of one. So the, the, the full quote is is better in my opinion because you know being the that Jack of all trades, right? That's how I see myself. I uh, I try to be educated, knowledgeable, you know, but definitely don't know everything. And that's something else, you know, once you get even a little bit into whatever you're all in on, you realize that you know nothing compared to other people. You know, like I'm I am a baby when it comes to strongman. Like I have there is so much more I have yet to learn, right? And you know, not just that, but you know, probably in my good in my my career as an as a population health specialist and I there's stuff I'm learning. And there's, you know, there's science changes. changes. Yeah, you know, science changes too. So, you know, we're, we're learning and navigating our own languages, you know, and that. So I, yeah, it's, there's there's a matter of of respect you have to have for the fact that you don't know anything. And I go through my day. Sometimes it's hard. I have uh, some some pretty heavy imposter syndrome sometimes, especially in the, the strongman world. Like, I'm, you know, I, I, like I said, very middle of you, all right. But, like, should I be here? Should I be doing this? There's people that are stronger than me. There's plenty of people stronger than me. Why aren't they doing it? Well, can, can they balance on a skateboard while lifting 100 pounds of this time? Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's only a few of us that can do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks so, for being here. Thank you. It's been fun. Uh, weird, though. I'm talking about myself. Like I don't have yeah. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's weird when I'm on somebody else's show. Right, right. right. Like, oh, I have to talk a lot more than I normally do. Yeah, tell you all the things that 